Uh, hi, Anne. I hope you <laughs> can hear me. This is uh, a pretty <laughs> weird, but anyway, <laughs> I, <laughs> if I may, um, I read your text and I found it really interesting as well as your presentation. Um, but uh, after speaking about uh, international uh, alliance, I was wondering if maybe the we can uh, separate the pedagogical exercise of making people understand where the money of bailout is coming from, from the taxes or what they contribute to the state, but the causes also, because you uh, post in the article that the, 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 the strength of a currency is derived from its tax system. But I understand maybe from coming from another uh, theoretical uh, perspective, that is most important the economic structure of economic especially in the global south, even if you have really strong tax system, eventually you're going to run out into external bottlenecks, which if you are not able to finance, which is the case of more global south countries, you will have an external crisis and eventually a devaluation. So you go back to not having a currency, a strong currency. I, I, I know many cases of global south countries that has decent tax system, but no one is commercing in the global uh, economy with their currency. They are using dollars, euros, and I don't know if any other currency, but mostly euros and dollars. So to, apart from the pedagogical exercise, I was thinking that maybe it would be helpful to, to get this uh, theory to, to incorporate global South players to the international alliance, either to change the financial architecture but also to finance this current account deficit, especially when we talk about a uh, Green New Deal. Because yeah, yeah. if we are not able to finance this current account deficit, I'm pretty sure that it's, if industrialization is not possible, Green New Deal is not even possible. Sure. But sure. that was more or less my... We, 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 we pick different questions and so then you answer all of them. We can, yeah. can we do that? Okay, so second one here. Okay, can you hear yeah. me now? Yes, I can, <laughs> now I can. <laughs> then most of the measures that you proposed it to reform the actual uh, financial system. Yeah. But I don't think that uh, we can achieve uh, sustainability in a capitalist growth society. Mm -hmm. All right. Then I cannot think in an alternative financial system that did not include some measures maybe some radical measures that, for example, uh, max income or even uh, max capital accumulation that would tackle the problem of uh, power relations uh, and also of lobbies and so on. Uh, exchange hate parities between currencies or, mid or the minimum wage parity between countries and some mm -hmm. kind of more radical measures. I think that uh, most of the measures that you proposed would be including in a kind of capitalism system. I cannot see how be in a capitalist system and still thinking about the 99% of the persons that you told before. Then, yeah, I do agree that we need a international agreement for implement uh, most of the measures that we need to implement. Mm -hmm. But I still that I think that's still in. A, yeah. yeah, not enough. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So where are the other questions? Okay, so we, you have to pick among the questions and make a global answer. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Anne. Thank you very much. I was wondering uh, about the international financial institutions. You mentioned IMF and the World Bank, mm -hmm. and they were born with the Bretton Woods Agreement and the increase in importance it had with the rise in neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. during the, the last decades. So um, the role they have played in the past as a last resource guarantors to pay uh, private credits of foreigners, especially mm -hmm. developing countries. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say this role has a change in a way or is it the same? And in a, um, in a new scenario where this transformation of the global financial system would happen, Mm -hmm. which uh, place would they have if they would ever yeah. still exist? Okay. Thank you. Okay, still. So how many questions? One more there. Right, one more. 
And I think that's no one more. That's okay. 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 Uh, hello, uh, Professor. I feel like I'm having a <laughs> anyway. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, we really appreciated it. I think. Um, mm -hmm. My question kind of adds on to Juan, what Juani was saying um, and someone else, but I think that the way that we're talking about this is we're kind of like uh, we're decoupling international organizations from uh, the international system uh, and uh, the, which is anarchic in its nature and which always relies on some kind of hegemon, right? Um, and at the end of your talk, you mentioned capital controls uh, just at the end without going into it too much. Um, and I mean, capital controls isn't a new idea, uh, but like a lot of other progressive social policy, it's always adopted when things go bad. Um, like in COVID, uh, we kind of started this conversation about capital controls again. Um, it was really adopted straight after the interwar period during the Bretton Woods period. Um, but the difference now to then, I, I, I would like to ask uh, is, then we had uh, international hegemon, uh, in the US and transitioning from the UK who agreed with uh, capital controls, right? The hegemon at the time agreed with capital controls and uh, now it doesn't really, right? And I would like to ask if you think that there's a way to get away with a system of capital controls without this agreement of the hegemon. Because if a country uh, like my country, South Africa, if we adopted capital controls, which many of us as progressives were pushing forward during uh, the COVID crisis, yeah. uh, in a highly financialized system, you mm -hmm. know, our capital markets would disappear, right? As soon as we thought about it, or as soon as we started that process, right? Yeah. So I, I, I'm I'm kind of uh, hesitant to to uh, to your proposal of capital controls in the absence of uh, the adoption by hegemon or some other coalition. And I would like to know your thoughts on that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, it's up to you now. So we will switch on the speaker. Right. Anthony, can you switch on? Okay, it's up to you. So it's a fantastic question. Thank you ever so much. Um, and lovely to hear South African voice. Um, the first question on the current account deficits and countries that have built up current account deficits. I want to recommend this book to everybody. It's called Trade Wars or Class Wars, and it's by Michael Pettis and Matthew Klein. And they argue that, um, you know, basically they've argued that we, the global economy, uh, countries within the global economy have been, as I tried to say earlier, oriented towards exports. Um, and that orientation, uh, and it's supply side as well, that orientation means that the country's always trading, trading in order to earn, in order to earn income, uh, to repay, uh, to keep manage the current account uh, imbalances. And they have argued that in fact, the result is massive current account imbalances with countries like China having massive surpluses. Germany has a massive surplus. The United States has a massive deficit and countries in between have a deficit. So these system of imbalances is deliberately constructed by this current system, right? And what they argue is that the problem with that is you get, uh, because you get this orientation, you get overproduction at home. We've been producing at home in order to earn for the people who export, and they tend to be the one percent to all the revenue. And you have under consumption at home, if you like. You have um, you have falling income and falling uh, purchasing power at home, and uh, this is so obvious everywhere you look. You know, Germany is a classic example where actually it has a massive external surplus, but internally at home. It has a shrinking purchasing power and, and people have been getting poorer and they're getting more and more frustrated and so on. The, South Africa is a classic example of this wonderful uh, exports, but not enough purchasing power at home. But that's the way the system is constructed. And he argue, they argue that this is a form of class war because the 1%, of course, are in, involved in trade and exports. And the rest of us at home are trying to earn a living and to work at home. So do we've got to balance the system and move away from that and prioritize the domestic economy over the international economy. And this kind of touches on what the last speaker said about South Africa and also what was said about um, 
uh, I think about from other countries. And then there was the question of, uh, the second question was, can you, so, so in order to manage current account deficits, we need to manage the economy at home, basically, uh, and, and, um, and build sustainability at home, increase purchasing power at home. It's a long, complicated argument, but I do recommend this book to understand it. Secondly, on the question of whether it's possible to do this within a capitalist system, and you know, I agree, I don't think it is. I think capitalism has to change. Um, has to be transformed. And I don't think it will be a capitalist system at the end of it, really. So I agree, I just have to say, I agree entirely with that. Uh, uh, capitalism cannot make a sustainable ecosystem, build a, help build a sustainable ecosystem and a sustainable economy. So what we will have, um, I'm acute of, of, of maintaining capitalism in this, but I don't agree, I think, uh, what we have what, what we have under the proposals that I make is certainly a transition away from capitalism. You know, I don't I'm, I'm not a Marxist and I don't believe it can be overthrown overnight. I think we need to think about how um, how we move into a transition away from capitalism, essentially. Then there was the question of Bretton Woods, the IMF, and the World Bank and the way in which their roles have changed. I think their roles have changed. Personally, I think you know, the, the Bretton Woods Agreement was far from ideal. It was not what Keynes wanted. It was what um, Harry Dexter White and the United States wanted. The United States was triumphant. It wanted to uh, consolidate its power. It wanted to become the hegemon. Um, and, uh, and it wanted the dollar to be all powerful. Keynes wanted a clearing union. And this brings me back to trade wars or class wars. You know, he wanted a clearing system whereby you know, like a bank operates between uh, commercial creditors and debtors between me and you uh, and helps to balance um, our system. So the international clearing union would balance uh, arrangements between surplus and deficit countries, and it would penalize countries that were in surplus like Germany and China, uh, as well as countries that were in deficit. And it would use that to build up reserves in order to help stabilize the, the whole system. It's a long story. Um, there's a wonderful book by, um, uh, where is it? I should get it for you. But anyway, there are there's some wonderful books on this to discuss, but I don't have enough time here. But the role of the Bretton Woods within that was that they were supposed to, if in effect, be Help help maintain the balances. Bretton Woods system, the institutions have become agents of the world's creditors. They are agents of Wall Street, essentially. And so, for as far as I'm concerned, they are irrelevant to this transformation. And we shouldn't invest them with more powers uh, than they have at the moment. In fact, we should uh, prevent them from using their role to reinforce the power of creditors in the financial system. Then the, the final question from the South African delegate was, you know, do we need a hegemon? Uh, and we, we, you know, we had a hegemon in, in the post-war period who supported capital controls, and we don't have one now. That's not true. Uh, we have a potential hegemon, China, that does support capital controls. So, um, and I quite agree with you, South Africa couldn't introduce capital controls tomorrow. Although there are ways of introducing capital controls, which are not, doesn't don't immediately block flows of capital um, in the way, for example, Britain's uh, uh, the Bank of England's idea for increased deposits for local. Now, New Zealand is doing this. New Zealand is saying foreigners can't buy property in Auckland unless they put down a decent deposit. And, you know, New Zealand hasn't fallen apart and exploded. It's, you know, it's managed to introduce those rules and cool its, uh, its property market without a uh, serious eruption. But I agree, you're absolutely right. It would be important to have a hegemon, to have a leading state that supports all this. And um, cap China imposes capital controls. China does not mess with the system. The Chinese Communist Party cannot afford to have social uh, disruption and social dislocation, which could lead to uprisings and remove the Communist pa Party from power. So it's not going to let go of management of the of the of the, the system, both international and locally. And we've seen that in the treatment of Jack Ma and other powerful capitalists 
in the recent past. So there is a hegemon and they are doing this. They're not, this is not the United States model. It's not the Western model that's been applied by China. So um, I'm not saying that China is the hegemon that we need or want. I'm just saying, <coughs> let's not kid ourselves. Capital controls are a feature of the global economy. And yes, they are applied by countries that are more powerful than South Africa is. And yes, if they were to be introduced, they would have to be introduced in very subtle ways. My worry is that they are going to be introduced in a crisis. They're going to be introduced at a moment of complete breakdown. And then they'll become irrational. Then they will become protectionist. Then they will become, they'll be applied in a kind of, <clears throat> in a way that maybe is not, they won't be applied in a measured and thoughtful and managed way. So we either choose to go for complete crises, authoritarianism and, and breakdown, or we choose to manage and go in a process of, with a degree of, of control. Um, that for me is going to be the choice ultimately. So I hear, I think those questions were really profound and thoughtful and I'm grateful for them. And I'm not for a moment convinced that I have answered your questions to the extent you would like me to. But I do urge you to think about this more because we need people like you to help us change the world. Thank you very much.